Quindi, non io, non ti ho.
Okay, it's uh, 5.30, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Besides tired, I know everyone's tired at, at this point of the semester. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, we just had spring break, but I think, you know, everyone's kind of feeling it already. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're every, everyone's tired at this point. Yeah, I know, especially you guys. I mean, I mean, so so I, I so I'll say that you know when I went to college, I went to a quarter system school, and so if you're if you're not familiar with quarter system, so um, you know it's it's a ten week quarter instead of uh, what you guys have is basically like a sixteen week semester. Um, <laughs> it, there's there's pros and cons. I mean, there's a. Uh, um, I mean, I think the biggest con that I think uh, for the semester system is that you guys just take so many classes at the same time. Um, you know that it just at any time it just becomes so overwhelming. But um, and I think another con is that you know if you're if you're stuck you know if you're stuck with the class or stuck with a professor that you don't like, then you're kind of stuck with them for the whole semester. But yeah, it is it is really long. But uh, but quarter system, you know, it, it also feels really short too. So like a class like this, you know, if we if you know this was taught at a quarter system it would only be like a 10 week class. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's also a little bit difficult because you're trying to cram just so much information together in 10 weeks, uh, but then you're taking less classes at the same time. Yeah. We're not smack talking about anyone. We're just, uh, we're just uh, talking about the differences between quarter system and, uh, and semester system school. So, um, and so, you know, seeing, just seeing how many, how many classes you guys have to take and like seeing just how packed your schedules are. I, I, I will say that I'm, I'm not envious at all. No, no, no. We're not. We're not talking about anyone here. We're just. Uh, <laughs> we're just talking about uh, just school systems in, in general. Just uh, hanging out while uh, we kind of wait for for more people to show up. Um, okay. Um, so, right. Ooh, fifteen units. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah, yeah. It's it's tough, you know. And and you know, and I and I and I feel for you guys. It's uh, you know, and and there's there's always kind of more and more pressure to get you know things done sooner. And faster, you know, and but you know they keep put they keep forcing kind of more requirements on us too, and requirements on the students. So I think it, it's it's getting harder and harder and harder to be a student every uh, every year. So you know, it, for me, it wasn't that long ago that I was a student, but I can I can see just you know with all the stuff that you guys have to deal with and all the you know all the courses you have to take and all the extracurriculars that you do, it's like it's it's way harder now. I don't know if I would survive if I was in your if I was in your shoes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so the, the plan for today is we're going to continue on with our lecture notes for um, convection in finite volumes, right? So we're about halfway done. And so hopefully we can finish everything today. If not, you know, we can continue just a little bit next uh, next Monday, right? Um, ooh, that's brutal. Yeah, you guys, you guys have just so much, so much stuff going on. Um, um, Right, so convection with finite volumes. So we should get through most of it today, and then you know we'll, we'll have, maybe we'll have a little bit to uh, to finish up on uh, on Monday. I yes, Pinky promise swear this is this is not on the on the exam. So whatever whatever was ending with homework five, that's that's it for the exam. Um, homework five, and also on the study guide too. So you know, and anything outside that study guide is not not going to be on the exam. There's no final. There's no final exam for this class, and so there's uh, there's you guys only have to worry about the final project. Yeah. And so this this stuff is uh, um, is is relevant. Um, this convection finite volume stuff is relevant if you're only if you're using finite volumes for the final project. Um, and so you know if you're if you're if you're going to do the final project with finite differences, you know this is um, you know uh, kind of more for your information. But you know hopefully hopefully it's 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 useful information. Um, because a lot of the codes that are out there use the finite volume method. And so what I'm hoping for, and, and I think we're still kind of on schedule for this, that for the last week, we might have, we probably have time to, to go over open foam. Um, and so that's one of the, the, the more popular finite volume codes out there. And so I'm, I'm trying my best to kind of, you know, go at a good pace so we can have a, a time for that at the end. But I think, I think we should be okay. Yep. All right. And so yeah, so the midterm is next week, um, and so that's that that is the last exam that I have for, for this class, um, and so um, you know definitely you know definitely um, start preparing for that. Um, so sometime later this evening or, or tomorrow morning, I'm going to put up a poll on the Canvas sites that you can vote on the the topics you feel most uncomfortable with. Um, that's going to be on this midterm, and then I'll cover those topics on Friday when I record the review video. Okay, so keep an eye out for the poll. I'll send an email out to everyone to vote on that as well. 
um, and then you know we can um, you know we can have that. But then after that midterm exam, there's no more exam for this class. It's, it's just the final project. So the final project is 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 a fair amount of work. Um, you know, not only in the coding but with the writing of the report. So I for you know I wanted you guys just to focus on that. And so I, I always hated it whenever you know I had a final project and a final exam because I felt like I could never really focus on either just because there was so much to do just for one class. And so. You know, usually my, my policy is that if I'm going to ask you to do a final project, then there's going to be no final exam. Yeah. Um, not sure if I mentioned before. Yes, yeah. So just like just like the first uh, just like the first exam, it's going to be just handwritten um, work and no code. Yeah. So actually, I actually just I finished writing it today actually, and I took it myself. It's just it's just handwriting handwritten stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So homework homework four will be included on the exam. So the, this exam is going to cover homework four and homework five primarily. Yeah. And yes, this is true for four ten and, and four forty two as well. So since so since those classes have final projects, there's going to be no final exams for those classes. Yeah. So it's just it's just the projects, and I just want you to focus on on just those. Mm -hmm. What about for, what's the P what's POSC? What's that? Political BS. I'm not following you. Oh, political science. I'm not sure. I, I, I can't I can't speak for their department. I can't even speak for other other faculty within our department. I can only just speak about, you know, my own policies and, and kind of what I what I do. So you know the, the the final projects. You know, I I think for all of the classes that I I, I have final projects and they're they're pretty significant. Then you know, and I and I do that on purpose just so that you know you you have something that's significant that you do in the class. Um, and I think I always think a project is usually more significant than than, than an exam too. And so you know, I want you to focus on just the projects and not the not the exam. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so that that's kind of enough uh, chatting for for now. So are there any any other questions I can answer about the exams or anything before we uh, get started for today? Homework five is due tonight, so don't uh, don't forget about that. Okay. No more exams for this class after this after this exam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no more questions. Uh, let's go. Um, let's go ahead and get started. And let's continue where we left off um, um, last uh, on Monday. Okay. And so remember, we we're talking about um, convection prop convection diffusion problems with finite volumes. Uh, and in particular, where we left off was talking about upwinding schemes. Okay. All right. And so what are upwinding schemes? So if you, if you kind of remember when we did convection with finite differences, um, you know, we ran into this issue where sometimes we would get unstable solutions. Um, oh, can I go over problem 3B? Uh, okay, yeah, let's let's do three B uh, really quick then, just because the homework's due tonight. All right, so let me let's. All right, let's do this. Okay, three B. So that's the that's the MATLAB one, correct? Okay, um, all right, so let's uh, do 3B. So 3B, I want you to solve 2B, but using MATLAB. Okay, so 2B, let's go up here. And so 2B looks like that. <laughs> okay, um, all right, so actually maybe maybe it's a bit easier if I share my screen. Let's, see, let's do that. Okay, all right, and so for problem 3B, uh, we wanna solve this, uh, um, solve this equation here with uh, with code right so let me go ahead and let's let me find the starter code for this one i think it's this one right here right okay and so we want to solve this uh this problem right here of uh 
um, minus five times uh, d partial squared phi partial x squared plus partial squared phi partial y squared is equal to cosine of pi x minus two sine of pi y, right? And we want to solve this with code um, and subject it to these boundary conditions, okay? Okay, and so, all right, okay, so here's the starter. Okay, so so here's, you know, the, the first part of the code, and so we don't have to change um, anything up here, and so basically we're saying we're running with the 50 by 50 grid. Um, here's our grid spacing and the matrices and the vectors and all that, and you can see here that we have a diffusion coefficient of five. So that's K, okay? Okay, and so the main part of this code is I want you to basically fill in um, these, um, these um, you know, these lines of code right here, right? So actually let's, let's open up the, uh, um, the sample code from before, 2D diffusion FVM, right? And so this is the sample code that I gave you from, uh, from last week uh, about um, you know two D diffusion FVM, right? And so let's kind of compare what we have here with what you know what I'm asking you to do for for this problem. Okay, all right. And so the main part of what I want you guys to implement is basically these if statements inside the loop here. Okay, and so uh, um, you can see that this this if statement right here, basically what I want you to do is I want you to fill in the appropriate coefficients for the east and west integrals of the cell, right? Because remember, since we're doing a uh, 2D diffusion, um, you know, with finite volumes, we're basically performing, you know, these four integrals around these cells, right? So if we look at, you know, cell number 11 right here, um, you know, we want to um, fill out the integrals for each of the boundaries, boundary integrals around this cell, okay? And so for the first part, you know, um, just like we did in class, uh, we're gonna do the integrals for both the east and the west at the same time, right? So this is basically both the integrals um, from Actually, let me go ahead and pull up the diffusion final volume. Okay. All right. Okay, so here's the problem that we're doing in, in the class, right? And so we have uh, basically partial squared phi partial x squared plus partial squared phi partial y squared is equal to three x y, okay? All right. All right, and so here's, uh, here's the code that we have in the class, right? Or here's the sample code, okay? And basically, you know, what I want you guys to do is uh, basically follow the same process that we did in the class uh, for this one, right? Okay, so first let's let's look at the case where we have the uh, just the interior nodes, right? So actually, that's that's kind of the easiest thing to start with. And so for the interior nodes, you know, all we're going to do is we're going to add, um, you know, plus um, plus two k um, for the diagonal term, right? Uh, because we're basically combining the uh, um, the contributions from the east and west integrals together. Okay, and so let me actually find a good spot. Okay, and so we have uh, this. This is, this is kind of our, our expression that we want to implement in code, um, you know, kind of before we start filling in the stuff, right? And so when I'm talking about the east and west integrals, what I'm talking about are this one, this term right here, so the partial phi partial x east times delta y, and also this one right here, um, so partial phi partial x west um, dy. And so let's just consider these two um, terms right here, um, and then, um, you know, we'll just work on that, okay? All right. And so I think uh, I think what I did at this point was I um, I divided both sides by minus one, okay, and then I have this k on the left hand side, right. And so when we when we fill in for the you know the finite difference approximations for partial phi partial x um, for the east and west, what we get are these two um, terms right here, right. And so we have phi e minus phi c um, over delta x minus uh, phi c minus phi w over delta x times delta y, okay? And if we assume that delta x and delta y are the same, then these two are going to cancel out, right? And so we have phi e plus phi w minus 2 phi c, right? Um, oh, I don't multiply. So, and then times minus 1 right here, and so, or times minus k. And so the coefficient in front of phi sub e and phi sub w, it's going to be a positive, um, a minus k on each one, right? And so that's what you see right here. And so you can see here for the coefficients for A 
uh, West ID, A West ID, A East ID, East ID, I have a minus K that corresponds to this minus K times phi East and this minus K times phi West, okay? Okay, um, and then now let's look at the phi sub C terms, right? And so for the phi sub C terms, we have a uh, minus one here and a minus one here, okay? And then we multiply that by positive K and that's how we get this positive two K right here. Right. And so that's, that's, we can basically fill in the same here because that's, you know, for the interior nodes, nothing's really going to change, right? And so for, um, for problem 3B, you would have A at my ID, my ID is equal to A at my ID, my ID plus two times K, okay? And then you have A at my ID, West ID, okay, uh, minus K, and then A at my ID, East ID minus K, okay? And so for the interior nodes, you know, nothing, nothing really changes. And so you can copy that basically exactly the same as from the, uh, you know, from the in-class code, okay? All right, question. My index variables aren't matching on line three, one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and so that's the interior nodes, and so that's 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 pretty easy to do. And you can do the same thing for the north and south integrals too. And so that's you know that's um, that's good. Okay. All right, and so now we need to we need to take care of the um, of the east and west sides, right? So let's go back to the uh, to the exam to the problem on the homework. Okay. I hate that it uh, does this. Okay. And you can see for both the east and west um, side integrals. Here we have Neumann boundary conditions. And so that's why I've denoted here, you know, west boundary, Neumann boundary, east boundary, Neumann boundary, okay? And so we need to implement the coefficients here for a Neumann boundary condition, okay? And so let's go, let's go back into our, um, into our example code and let's see how we implement a Neumann boundary. And this is actually the perfect, um, the perfect case for this. And so from the example problem in the class, we had a Neumann boundary condition of zero on the right side of the domain. And so that's basically, you know, um, that's basically our east integral, right? And so what we should see in our example code from the class that the east integral should be replaced by a Neumann boundary, okay? All right. And so, you know, because we have an east Neumann boundary here and we have an east Neumann boundary here, we can apply basically, you know, the exact same code, okay? And so first of all, we have A at my ID, my ID, okay? And so we're gonna have A at my ID, my ID, uh, plus K, right? And so that plus K comes from um, the West integral, right? And so because our boundary condition here is on the East, the West integral still remains unchanged, okay? And so we're gonna have this exact same line right here too. And so we have A at West, I, my ID, West ID, A, my ID, West ID, minus K, right? And that's what we have right here. Okay, and then for the right-hand side, you can see here that we're applying our Neumann boundary condition here. And so we have B at my ID equal B at my ID plus K times the Neumann value. And so the Neumann value here, um, well, it was zero here, but for the homework, for the homework, it's 25, okay? okay. Plus times dy. Right. And that's because, uh, and that's because of our Neumann rules for, um, you know, for that, um, you know, for the Neumann boundary condition. Right? Um, and so this is, this is the case, you know, when we're evaluating the east and west integrals together, if we have an east boundary condition, that means we're only evaluating the coefficients for the west integral and then moving the, the Neumann boundary condition to the right hand side of the equation. Right. And so that's, that's exactly kind of what we have uh, right here. All right, and so now let's do the west, in, and so now let's do the case where we have a boundary condition on the west side, right? And so that's going to be all of these cells right here, and so all of these cells, um, you know, we have, um, you know, um, conditions like this. Okay, and so first of all, you know, we uh, we have to do our diagonal term, and so our diagonal term looks like this, okay? right? Oh, 
So the crazy ones are the ones where we have both Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions. Yeah. So, so you know, I I structured this code, you know, to to uh, to basically simplify that um, for you, right? And so it's it's not that you have to do something particular for the corner um, for the corner um, cells. The fact that we have these if statements here automatically handles the fact that if you're in a corner, right? And so let's say that we're in this corner right here for cell one, right? And so for cell one, you can see that we have a boundary on the on the west side. And so this will automatically take care of the west integral. And then in a separate if statement, then we handle the south boundary down here. And so we do something separate uh, right here, okay? And so the way I've structured this code is that, you know, we're basically gonna handle one integral at a time. And so if you do, if you are at a corner and you have to apply two boundary conditions, you know, the code will kind of handle that for you because we're, we're not doing everything at once. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a big difference compared, uh, you know, with how we structure the finite volume codes versus the finite differences is that for finite volumes, you know, we kind of tackle one integral at a time. And if we if we end up in a case where we have multiple boundary conditions, then it's kind of already automatically handled by, by the code, okay? All right. And so you don't have to do anything special here. And so, you know, if you, if you, you know, look at this code right here, you know, I, I don't have an if statement for if you're on a west and a south boundary, right? Uh, because it's, it's handled already, right? The only thing that, that can't happen is that you can't be on a west boundary and an east boundary at the same time, right? Uh, the only way that can happen is if we have one cell that goes all the way across this entire domain. So if we have the cell five and it stretches all the way here, that's the only case where you'd have basically a west, a west boundary condition and an east boundary condition at the same time. Right? And so that's why in this code, I kind of group the east and west integrals together and I group the north and south integrals together as well. Um, because those, because uh, you know normally you don't have either one, right? And so you don't have both, right? And so for most practical cases, you know, you're, you're going to have just either an east boundary or a west boundary or neither. You're on an interior cell. Um, but what you can have is you can have both a west boundary and a south boundary, right? And that's handled by the fact that we have separate if statements here. Okay. All right. And so let's go ahead and finish this up. And so our boundary condition on the right is a minus 10, right? And so you have to be careful of the sign right here. Remember, the sign matters for the uh, um, for the Neumann boundary conditions. Okay, um, and so I think it should be a minus k times minus ten times dy. Okay, and so these two should have opposite signs because of uh, you know because their their integrals are are opposite. Right? So remember, for the east integral, we have a positive sign out here, and then for the west integral, we have a negative sign here. And so you have to respect those signs, you know, when you're implementing that in the in the code. Okay. Okay. Um, so any any uh, hopefully does that uh, that clear things up a little bit for that uh, for that problem? Could I have done this code somewhat similar to two D FDM? Yeah. So it's it's it is different, and so because um, because the fine volume codes, you know, we're we're basically handling it like one integral at a time, and so you can you can almost think of it like um, you know like we're starting from here, right? And so basically, this is the term that we're basically discretizing it in the code. You know, because each of these integrals are kind of dis it's it's kind of its own thing. You know, the way the best way to kind of handle this is is to kind of handle it kind of one integral at a time and then implement that. And so you're going to see that again with the with the um, with convection too. And actually, with when you add convection together with diffusion in finite volumes, it really becomes a, a really beneficial to handle it one integral at a time because each integral there is going to be a lot more complicated than than what we have here. Um, and so the the logic that the logic that you know that I, I want you guys to think about is you know remember for this if for this for loop here we're visiting every single cell right, and so we're visiting cell one, cell two, cell three, cell four. What we're doing here is that, you know, for each of these cells, we know that we have four integrals that we need to evaluate, right? And so we have to evaluate the east and west integrals, and then we have to evaluate the north and south integrals, right? And so all I'm doing here is I'm checking um, to make sure, or checking to see if the, if the side of the cell, or, or either the east or west side, or the north or south side, is I'm checking if that border is one of the boundaries. And if it does, um, you know, then we apply our boundary condition to it. Um, but, you know, if, if that side doesn't border a boundary, then we can apply, you know, the usual logic here with the, with the interior cells. Okay. Yeah. So, so actually, so actually I admit that the way I kind of wrote this code, um, I, I did it kind of more for compactness. 
um, but it's, it is a little bit hard to understand because I'm handling both the east and west um, integrals at the same time. But I think once you see the 2D convection diffusion code, maybe that one will make a little bit more sense because there I make it a lot more explicit that, you know, this if statement is for the west integral, this if statement is for the east integral, this state if statement is for the north integral, this if statement is for the south. And so you'll see instead of two if statements here, which is essentially what we have, what you'll see in the convection diffusion code is that there's four um, explicit if statements, one for each of the one for each of the integrals. Yeah, and so it's it's a little bit hard to kind of structure it the same as the finite um, difference code because it's uh, um, you know it, it's fundamentally a little bit different things. Yeah. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, if if you're if you're getting a a, a purple graph, you can you can send me your code. I think probably might be easier for me to kind of debug those on kind of an individual individual basis. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if you're having issues, just uh, just send me your code and then um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll check it out tonight. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so uh, let's go back and let's go back to the, the lecture notes. Uh, and so we're talking about um, convection diffusion with uh, with finite volumes. Okay. All right. And so in particular, uh, we're looking at upwinding schemes, right? And so upwinding schemes, remember, the reason we did this was to make sure our solutions are stable. And so the way that we did this with finite differences was we uh, we basically replaced our finite difference method um, with or our central difference method with either a forward difference or a backward difference. And so when we did that, that was basically our upwinding scheme. Was we was we we made basically replacements on on that. Okay. And so for finite volumes, the way that we're going to apply um, an upwinding scheme is we're going to change the way that we make our um, our boundary uh, approximations. Our face. I should stop saying boundary because I think that's that's a little bit confusing. So it's we're going to change the way that we make our um, face interp and uh, interpolations. And so, just uh, let's let's do it in the one D case, just so that you can kind of see what's what's going on. Okay. And so, let's say that we have three uh, finite volume cells here, and so we have phi sub c, which is our center cell, and we have our left neighbor and our right neighbor, or I guess west and east, okay? And so we're gonna focus here on this center cell, okay? And then if you remember, you know, part of the finite difference uh, or finite volume method for convection was we had to approximate the values of phi at these locations, right? And so these are the faces um, of, our, of our finite volume cell. Okay. And so what we did was we said that, um, okay, you know, since this face here sits right in between phi sub c and phi sub w, let's just take the average in between them. Okay. 
right? So that makes sense, right? So, you know, that, that, that location is right in between those two cells. And so it makes sense that we take the average, you know, in between those two, um, those two parts, okay? And so what I didn't tell you at the time was that, you know, by taking this average, you know, what we're basically assuming is we're basically assuming the same thing as like a central difference scheme, okay? Uh, and so, you know, you can kind of think of it as, you know, we're taking kind of the center, which is, you know, the center in between those two um, for that value. Okay? All right. And so if you're going to do this, um, you know, this, this actually leads to higher accuracy, right? And so, you know, um, central difference schemes generally do have higher accuracy, but they can be unstable. Okay? Because what could happen is that if you have a convection velocity that blows this way, right? And your Peclet number is greater than two because your, your grid might be a little bit too coarse, um, you might end up with an unstable solution, okay? And so a better way to do this, or not a better way, but uh, the upwinding way to do this is to say that instead of taking the, the average of the two face uh, of the two self-centered values, let's just take the value upstream or upwind of the convection velocity. And so the, the upwind direction here, since the velocity is going from left to right, the upwind direction here is, is on the left, right? And so we can approximate this, uh, this face value phi sub little l with phi sub w, right? And so it's no longer the average in between phi sub w and phi sub c. Now it's just, you know, the cell that's on the left, right? And so that's phi sub w. And then it's phi sub r right here. We're going to approximate it with um, phi sub c, because that's the one that's uh, that's that's the one that's in the upwind direction uh, from the velocity. Okay, because um, remember, you know, this is a little bit more stable here because we're taking information from the up, upstream side instead of trying to interpolate between something that's that's downstream. Okay, All right. And so if we make this approximation here, this is going to change our um, finite volume um, equations. Okay, and then I'll show you how that uh, modifies that on the on the next page. All right. And so there are, are there uh, any questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so let's go, let's see how this uh, modifies our finite volume equations, right? And so in 1D, uh, when we did our, um, you know, convection and diffusion um, integral, uh, we ended up with an expression like this. All right, and so, you know, hopefully this logic here might help you out with the, uh, with the homework as well. And so I'm going to, I'm going to break this up into two separate integrals, right? Because remember for, uh, for 1D cases, you know, we only have two faces here, right? So we have basically just have the left face and the right face. And so I'm gonna break it up into all the terms that are evaluated on the left face and all the terms that are evaluated on the right face, right? Because that's the same logic we're gonna do in, in 2D as well. All right. All right, so we have U times uh, phi at XR minus K times partial phi partial X at XR, okay? And so those are all the terms that are evaluated on the right face of the cell. Right? And then we're gonna have all the same things on the left face with the minus sign because we because we integrate, right? So it's gonna be u times phi at xl, okay, minus k partial phi partial x at xl. Okay. Um, and all this is equal to q at xc times delta x. Okay. All right. And so in particular, you know, I want to focus on these terms, right? Because these are the values of phi that are on the faces of our cell, right? Because before what we did was we, we approximated these, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, uh, that was our central difference scheme. So our central difference scheme, we approximated this by just the average in between those two. But we're not going to do that anymore because now we're going to do an upwinding scheme. Okay. And so for the upwinding scheme, we're just going to take these to be the upstream phi value um, depending on the um, direction of u. Okay. And so if u is positive and if it's going from left to right, then phi at xr, we're just going to replace this with phi sub c. 
And then this uh, phi at XL, this is just going to be phi sub W. Okay. All right. And so if we plug that in and then we evaluate this, this term, what we get is U at times phi sub C minus the diffusion term we can leave alone because the diffusion term, you know, is, is, is beautiful and it did nothing wrong, right? And so we can um, just leave it alone. And so we're still going to do our uh, straight line interpolation for, uh, for the diffusion term. should be phi sub east. Okay. All right, and so if we, uh, um, you know, if we um, group like terms together in terms of the phi values, then what we get is the following. So we have minus u minus k divided by delta x. Uh, phi sub west plus u plus u plus 2k divided by delta x uh, phi sub c plus minus k over delta x uh, phi sub um, east. Okay. And this is equal to our source term which I've neglected up to this point, but you know, we need to include it back. Okay. Right. And then we have, uh, you know, and this is our, this is our finite volume equation for convection diffusion in 1D with upwind D. Okay. All right. Um, and so, you know, um, um, you know, just, just kind of like, you know, everything, you know, in this class, you know, I, I box a lot of these formulas for you, but you know, I, I want you guys to do more than just kind of plug and chug into these formulas. You know, I really want you to kind of pay attention to the process that we took, you know, in order to obtain this equation, right? And so this process of, you know, starting from this guy up here, right? Starting from this guy up here um, and then plugging in the appropriate values for phi at the faces, um, you know, and then working through the math from that, that's, that's what I want you guys to know, you know, at least from the theory, right? Because that's that's something that you know you're going to need to do for you know for the exam as well. Okay. All right, and so this is this is for an upwinding case when the velocity is going from left to right, and of course if the velocity is going from right to left, then that's going to change you know how you how you evaluate these um, these terms as well, right? And so kind of keep that in mind, you know, as you uh, you know um, as we go about this. Uh, okay, so any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. And so that's, uh, that's 1D, um, you know, upwinding convection diffusion. And so now let's move on to 2D, right? And so hopefully, you know, um, I don't think we're going to get to the code today, but hopefully, you know, what we cover today will kind of help a little bit with the logic for um, homework 5, 3D. Okay. Um, because the way, you know, and, and, you know, the code is up there for uh, the sample code for 2D convection diffusion. Right. And so if you want to look at the structure of that code and then use that same structure for, you know, a homework five, uh, three B, you know, I think that's, that's, that's probably, um, that's probably something good to do. Cause I, I like that structure a lot better than, than the one I did for, for three B. Okay, so we're on 2D uh, convection diffusion with finite volumes. Okay, so well, first of all, let's write out our general equation um, in vector form. Okay. Right, and so we have the divergence of velocity times phi okay, minus k divergence of the gradient of phi. So that's our diffusion term. Okay, is equal to q of xy. And so this is our starting convection diffusion equation in vector form. Okay. And just like we always do, we're going to take this equation and integrate it over the cell. Okay. And so what we get is the double integral of divergence of 
v v uh, dA uh, minus k. Actually, let me group all this into one integral. Right? So minus k divergence of dA, okay, divergence of the gradient is equal to double integral of q of xy dA, okay. All right, and so what we're going to do here is that uh, you know we recognize that these guys, um, you know, these are um, you know integrals that we can convert to boundary integrals using the divergence theorem. Okay. I should say face integrals. Okay. And then what we get from that is, um, let's see, integral around the bound, around the uh, around the exterior of the cell, around the faces of v times v dot n minus k at uh, gradient of v dot n, okay, ds. Okay, because it's going around the boundary, and then integral of Q dA. Okay. Right. So this is the finite volume equation for uh, um, you know for two D convection diffusion, and then what we're going to do next is we're going to take this um, you know this line integral on the left hand side, and then break it up into our four face integrals. Okay, and so we're going to make all the same assumptions we did before, and so we're going to assume that you know we're on a square domain and we have square um, you know um, square elements or square cells, and our outward unit normals are in the same direction um, each time. Okay. All right. So any questions on um, on this so far? All right, so let's go ahead and draw the uh, the cell again, and then let's uh, let's label each of the uh, each of the each of the faces of the cell. Uh, wait, Professor, can you go back just a second and take a picture of that? Sure. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So here's our cell, and so we have our north face, we have our south face, we have our east face. We have our west face, okay. And remember, we're uh, we're going to be evaluating that integral on the left hand side on each of these faces here, right? and so we're basically performing four one D integrals across each of them. Okay? And each of these faces, of course, has their own uh, unit normal vector, okay. Okay. Um, and then we need to perform basically the, the dot product in between them, right? And so uh, let's keep in mind that remember the normal vector is either going to be, you know, um, one, zero. This is for the east face. This is going to be um, zero, one for the north face, the minus one, comma, zero for the west face, and zero, comma, minus one for the south face. And let's, let me write out the, uh, uh, our other two vectors here, which is going to be the velocity vector. And so the velocity vector is going to be u comma v, okay? And also our gradient vector from our diffusion term, this is going to be partial phi, partial x, comma, partial phi, partial y, okay? All right. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take each of the face integrals that we had from the previous page and then show you kind of what they're, um, you know, what they what they look like after applying, um, you know, all these dot products and all of these integration rules. Okay. So let's start with the east one. And so for the east one, we have 
integral on the east face of phi v dot n minus k gradient to phi dot n, okay, uh, ds. And so if we evaluate this on the east face, we basically have v dot n. And so we have basically u comma v dot product with one comma zero, okay? And so this becomes u, okay? And then this quantity right here of gradient of phi dot n, and so we have partial phi partial x comma partial phi partial y dot product with the vector one comma zero, okay? And then when, and we, when we apply that dot product, we have partial phi, partial x right here, okay? All right, and so if we, uh, if we, you know, if we apply those dot products and we apply our trapezoidal rule for integration, what we get is the following. Right? So we have phi sub e um, times u minus k partial phi, partial x at the east face, okay? All times delta y. Where this phi sub this phi sub little e here, this is the value of phi on the east face. Okay. And so if I if I label that up here, this phi sub e would basically be located right here. Okay. Um, but you know we're not solving for the values of phi at that at those locations. So what we want is the value of phi at the center of the cell, phi sub c, and also its neighbor, phi sub big e. Okay. All right. And so let's assume let's assume for now that we're just going to use our um, usual central difference. And so um, and so this um, value of phi sub little e here is going to be just the average. And so this is going to be phi sub c plus phi sub big e divided by two. Whereas this derivative here, you know, we're going to use our same finite difference approximation that we used in the, uh, you know, for diffusion. Okay, and so this is going to be phi sub um, e, big E minus phi sub c, divided by delta x. Okay. Right. And so that's the uh, that's the east integral. Okay. And so I'm going to repeat basically this, uh, you know, this process for the um, for the north and south and west integrals, okay, um, just so you kind of see where each of these terms come from. Okay? And I'm going to leave it in that form because that's that's basically how I've implemented each of the code um, the codes for you, okay. And so um, you know I'm going to leave it in that form so that you know when you when you go to implement it, you can just use that and uh, you know um, plop that kind of directly into the into the code itself. Uh, okay, so any any questions on uh, on this so far? Okay. All right, so that's the that's the east integral there. So now let's do the south one. Right. And so for the south integral, we again have integral on the south face, right? Times v times v dot n. Okay, minus k gradient of phi dot n ds. Okay. Let's evaluate each of the dot products first. And so for the south face, we know that n is equal to zero comma minus one, right? And so this uh, this this dot product here will be minus v. Okay. And this um, um, this quantity right here will be uh, minus um, partial phi, partial y. Okay. All right. And so if we plug uh, plug those things in and we evaluate the integrals, what we get is minus phi sub s, um, phi sub little s times v plus k partial phi partial y on the south face. Okay. Times delta x. For this phi sub s right here, we're going to substitute just the average in between the two. Okay. Right, so that's phi sub c plus phi sub big S, okay, divided by two. 
And this guy is just going to be the our derivative group. So just p sub c minus p sub big S of that delta y. Okay. All right. And so uh, um, now let's do the the west face. Okay. And so for the west face, we have integral on the west face of v v dot n minus k gradient to phi dot n, okay, ds, okay, or n hat for the west face is going to be minus one comma zero, right? Okay, and so if we evaluate these guys, this uh, v dot n right here, this going to be a minus u, okay, and this gradient to phi dot n, this is going to be a minus partial phi partial x. Right. And so if we uh, if we evaluate those guys and plug it in, what we get is minus phi sub w, phi sub little w here times u plus k phi sub c minus phi sub um, um, oh sorry, jumping ahead. And so we have a minus um, phi sub little w times u plus uh, k times partial phi partial x um, on little w, okay, times delta y, okay. Where if we make the substitutions in here, this phi sub uh, little w is going to be the average of phi sub c and phi sub big w. And this guy right here is going to be phi sub c minus phi sub um, w divided by delta x. Okay. All right. And so I know this is uh, this is fairly tedious, but it's uh, um, you know um, you know it's uh, that's 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 kind of just the process of uh, of finite volumes. Okay. And so we we have one more integral to do, which is the north integral. Uh, but before I do that, are there any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right. And so now let's finally do the, the north integral. Okay. All right. So for the north integral, we have integral on the north face of v times v dot n minus k times gradient of phi dot n ds, okay, where n hat for the north face is going to be 0 comma 1, okay. And so if we perform that dot product between the velocity vector and n, what we get is a positive v, okay. And then for the dot product between the gradient of phi and n hat, what we get is a positive partial phi, partial y. Okay. All right. And so if we evaluate those uh, um, those terms right there, what we get is a positive phi sub little n times v, right, minus k partial phi, partial y at the north face. Okay. All this times delta x. Where this phi sub little n right here, this is going to be the average of phi sub big N plus phi sub C divided by 2. And this partial phi partial y right here, this is going to be phi sub big N minus phi sub C divided by delta y. Okay. All right. Um, and so now that we have all of these integrals like this, I'm going to go put them in kind of a slightly more convenient form. Um, and so, you know, that so that you can apply them as uh, as coefficients into your, um, um, you know, um, into your code. Okay. And so let's do uh, basically each of them kind of one by one. And so let's do the east integral. And so all I'm going to do all I'm going to do is I'm going to take kind of the um, the terms that I had um, before um, and then just, um, you know, um, put them in terms of coefficients for phi sub c and the neighboring cell. And one thing I'm going to assume here, 
I'm going to assume that we have even grid spacing in the x and y direction as we have delta x is equal to delta y is equal to delta, okay? And so for the east integral, what we have is, um, let's see, we have u delta y, or u delta divided by 2 times um, phi sub e, okay? Um, that's, the, not the, that's not the only thing to do with phi sub e, right? So we have um, u times delta divided by 2. I'm kind of doing this in real time too, so I apologize. Minus k times phi sub e, okay? Plus a uh, u delta divided by 2 plus k plus k, yeah. Okay, phi sub c, right? And so th those are the two coefficients that you would... Uh, um, you know, that you would find. Okay. So now let's do the uh, now let's do the south integral. Okay. And so for the south integral, if we combine the like terms, what we get is a uh, uh, minus v delta divided by two um, v delta divided by two uh, minus k. Yes, B sub S plus a uh, minus V delta divided by two um, plus K V sub C, okay? And then we'll do the West integral. Okay. And then for the West integral, what we have is a minus u delta divided by 2 minus k v sub big w plus minus u delta divided by 2 plus k v sub c okay and then for the north integral what we have is a positive v delta divided by 2 minus k v sub north plus positive v delta divided by 2 um, plus k v sub c, okay? Right. And so these are the coefficients for, you know, uh, v sub c and also its neighbor when we evaluate each of these integrals individually, right? And so if you want to get one algebraic equation from this, what you would have to do is you would have to take this and add them all together, okay? Uh, and, that's, and that's what I have in the notes. And so if you look at um, lecture notes 11, and you look at the bottom of page 10, you know, all I've done was I basically took this and I've added them all together to get one single algebraic expression, right? Um, but I'll leave it, I'll leave it in this form for now, um, just to kind of help illustrate how you would do this in the code, okay? Because in the code, you know, what you would do is you would have one if statement or one block of code to handle each of these integrals individually, okay? Um, and then, you know, you can, you can then update its value or change its value if you're on one of the boundaries. So let me go ahead and say, um, I have to do add all together to get one algebraic expression. Okay. Um, but leaving it in this form right here will. I, I think it makes I think it makes um, the boundary conditions a little bit easier to do because then you can basically handle one 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 face of the cell at a time. Yeah. It's not going to be on the exam, no. The, the diffusion will, but not convection diffusion. So what we're doing right now is both convection and diffusion um, in finite volumes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, but you know, if, if you want to basically reform our theory from diffusion finite volumes in this way, and to basically evaluate each of the phase integrals on their own, that might help make it make a little bit more sense when you're uh, when you're doing the hand calculations and when you're doing your your code. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so any uh, any questions on on this so far? Okay. 
All right, and so that's that's kind of the general um, general form for dif um, convection diffusion with finite volumes. Um, and so now let's talk about the boundary conditions because I think this is this is the thing that kind of trips people up. Okay. And so for um, for finite volume um, problems that have both convection and diffusion. Um, you know, the best way to handle boundary conditions is to handle it one integral at a time. Okay, um, and so um, basically the logic that that you that you need to go through, you know, as you're visiting each cell, is you you know we're going to evaluate each of the integrals one at a time, right? And so first let's check the east integral, right? And so we have to check is our east space on one of the boundary conditions in our domain. And so here you can have you can have basically two two answers to this, right? And so on the one hand, you can say no. You can say the east face the east face faces an interior, right? And so if if that's the case, then you can you can basically implement the uh, coefficients from the previous page. And if yes, then what we can do is we can uh, we can start to implement those those boundary conditions. Okay. All right, and I'll show you how to do that on the next page. And so we'll do first Dirichlet boundary conditions and Neumann boundary conditions. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's a uh, it's it's a lot of coding, and so um, you know we we're not going to get to it today. But if you want to look at the two D convection diffusion code, um, then you can kind of see this this kind of logic in in action. Yeah. Uh, and so what you'll see is that you know um, you know I'm basically going to have one if statement for each of the different um, each of the different integrals. Yeah. All right. So any questions on uh, on this before we uh, we jump into uh, Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions? Okay. All right. So let's talk about Dirichlet VCs then. Okay. And so Dirichlet VCs, uh, you know, um, remember the way that we implement this is this is we implement a specified known value on the face. Okay, and so let's let's do just an example of you know let's say that we have a Dirichlet boundary condition on the on the north face. So schematically, it looks something like. Right, so let's say that we have a known quantity phi naught up top. Okay. Okay. 
but we have neighbors in the west, the east, and the south directions. Okay. All right. And so in these cases, you know, because we have neighbors on the east, west, and south, we can leave those integrals alone. And so the only integral that we need to modify here is the north one, because that's where our boundary condition is. Okay. All right. And so just to kind of remind you, our north integral looks like uh, looks like this. Okay. Right, so we have v v dot n minus k partial phi um, oh. uh, gradient of phi dot n ds okay and if we evaluate the dot products and then we integrate what we get is phi sub little n times v minus k partial phi, partial y on the north face, okay? Okay. And so what we're gonna do here is that we're gonna modify, because usually what we do is we plug in for these guys, this phi sub little n and partial phi, partial y at n, we, we, we substitute values in here based on the north neighbor, but here we don't have a north neighbor, but what we do have is a Dirichlet boundary condition up top, right? And so what we can do is we can make different substitutions here. And so instead of, you know, instead of phi sub c plus phi sub n divided by two, which is what we did before, right? What we can do instead is we can just replace this directly with phi naught, which is, you know, which is exactly the value of phi at that face, okay? And so there's actually no approximation here. And then for this derivative right here, you know, we're gonna replace it with uh, you know, the same thing that we did in diffusion. And so we're going to do phi naught minus phi sub c divided by delta y divided by 2. Okay. All right. And so uh, once we kind of um, apply this um, and we, you know, and we plug it all in, then what we get for this integral is we get 2 times k times phi sub c, okay, plus um, phi naught, oh, all this is, is multiplied by delta, sorry, okay, um, phi naught times v delta minus 2k phi naught, okay, and so this now becomes our north integral right here. And so you can see that we, we don't have any um, coefficient in front of phi sub n because it, it doesn't exist. Okay? And now we have these two terms here for the Dirichlet boundary condition. Right? And since these guys here are all known, we kick these over to the right-hand side because okay? they all involve you know, phi knots, which are, which are a known quantity. Okay, okay. Uh, so any questions on this before we move on to the Neumann boundary conditions? Okay. All right, and so for the Neumann BC, these are um, even simpler to do than, than before, right? Because remember the Neumann BC, uh, what these specify is a specified flux. And so let's do an example of, um, you know, let's say that we have a, a, a Neumann boundary condition on the east face of our cell.
And so this phi um, or this gamma right here, this is our prescribed flux. I should say uh, partial phi partial n is equal to gamma. Okay. All right. Uh, and so since this uh, boundary condition here is on the east face, uh, what we can say is that the north integral, the south integral, and the west integral, all of those are going to be unchanged. And so, you know, since this boundary condition is on the east face, you know, we're going to only modify just the is integral. Right. And so our east integral is um, phi times v dot n minus k partial phi. Um, I keep doing that. Gradient to phi dot n ds. Okay. And so the nice thing about this is that this is even um, you know simpler than than the Dirichlet one because we we actually don't even have to proceed any past any of this, right? Because remember what this integral represents. What this whole integral represents is this is the um, the combined diffusion and convection flux across the east face of our cell. And so if that's the case, and you know, and if, if that's the case, and you know, now we have a prescribed flux, you know, all we can um, all we have to do is that we can say that this integral here is now going to be replaced by that flux. And so instead of you know going through the whole motions of you know applying the dot products and doing the approximations, we can just say that this entire integral is just going to be gamma times delta. Okay. And that's it. Okay. And so when you tackle things kind of one, um, you know, integral at a time here, you know, it, it kind of becomes, um, you know, um, a little bit more convenient for the Neumann boundary condition. Okay? And so overall, you know, the code might look a bit more intimidating just because there's a lot more if statements. Um, but, you know, tackling things kind of one at a time, you know, will help you kind of um, deal with that. Okay. All right. And so we do have a, a tiny bit of time left. And so actually, let me show you um, kind of what, um, what I mean by that. And if you want to restructure your homework five problem three B like this code, um, you can go ahead and do that. Right, so let me go ahead and share my screen again. Okay. All right. And so this is the this is the example problem that I wanted to do with you guys. Okay. And so here we have our u value of fifty, our v value is five. Okay. Our value of k is two, and then here are all the boundary conditions. And then let me show you kind of how the code is structured. Okay. And so this is a code that you have um, already. So this is on, um, you know, this is on, um, you know, um, Canvas already. Okay. And you can see here that you know um, section one, you know, is all the same. We don't have to worry about that. But section two here, this is where the magic happens, right? And so you can see here what I've what I've done is I've kind of restructured this code where this section right here, you know, this section performs the is integral. And so first thing we do is I, I check to see if we're on a east um, an east boundary, okay? And so if we're on cells 4, 8, 12, or 16, then what we do is we, we you know, we modify the equations to account for the boundary conditions, okay? Um, else, you know, say that we're on an interior face, then we apply just the usual east um, coefficients here, right? And so we have A at my ID, my ID, and so this, remember, phi sub C, and then this A at my ID, east ID, this is the east, okay? <clears throat> and then you can do the same things for, you know, everything else. And you can see for the south boundary here, this is kind of the simplest where we have a zero flux. And so, you know, here we don't do anything. Okay. Right. As you can see the same for the west and the north integrals as well. Right. Um, okay. 
Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll go over this code kind of in a lot more detail on, on Monday, just because, you know, there's there's kind of a lot going on. Uh, but, you know, since there were some questions on 3B on the homework, you know, I, I did want to point this out that you can you can restructure your code to look like this if you if you want. OK. All right. And so are there uh, any any final questions before we uh, we wrap up? I'm, I'm going to stick around for another, you know, 15, 20 minutes because I, I know you guys, um, some of you are having problems with debugging. And so if you guys, if you, uh, if you want, if you want to send me your code, I'll stick around for another 15, 20 minutes to, to help you debug. Right? Um, so, but, but, but besides that, um, you know, that's all I got time for today. Um, and so thank you guys for tuning in. Um, you know, um, have a good weekend, best of luck studying and uh, vote and vote in the poll tomorrow because, you know, that's, uh, I'm going to use that to, uh, to do the review on Friday. Yeah, so if you want to send me your code for the homework for 3B, then I can, um, I'm going to stick around for another 15, 20 minutes to help, help, help you guys debug that. Yeah. Yeah, so either uh, email or, uh, um, um, or Discord, whichever, whichever is most convenient. Grad student. Um, hi, Professor. Hi, how's it going? Uh, I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Um, so I have a question. Yep. So when you set up the west and east boundaries, so they have the opposite sign, right? But when I run the code, it doesn't give me the exact graph as a solution. So for the so, so for the Neumann boundary condition, they have opposites. I, I might have gotten it wrong earlier. So I think uh, I think you know I think I put negative on one and positive on the other one. I think yeah. I was I was going through it. I might I might have gotten it mixed up. And so it might have been positive and, and negative. And so okay. Um, oh go ahead. Because I my code both of them have positive on the uh -huh. B and I it will give me exact graph as the solution. So that's the correct one, right? Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, if it matches the uh, if it matches the graph that's on the homework document, then that's um, that's that's the correct one. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I just want to clarify that. Yeah, I, I think I, I might have gotten the so the signs wrong earlier, but if you if you if you reverse it on yours and you get the right thing, then that's uh, uh, that's good. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. All right, Kyle. Let me take a look at your code. Let me just run it and see what I get. Okay. And so let's look at T solution. Okay. All right, so you're getting something. It's just, uh, but yeah, they're not the right one. Okay, so let's take a look. Get the feeling it's in the uh, south and north boundary conditions. Yeah, because these these were the Dirichlet ones. So these were ah okay. Yes, I think I think this this needs some work right here. Let me let me just double check with uh, with my own solution just to make it a little bit faster here. Let's see. Oh no, it is right. Yeah, I played with the positives and minus uh, negatives and like different units and stuff. And I would almost always get uh, just a big purple square. Let's see. 
Oh, you know, I think the reason is because it's because my solutions don't have um, don't have K. And so I, I have the same thing as, as you right now. It's just that my um, I don't have K right here for whatever whatever reason. Because uh, I could because I hard I hard code the bounds in this. So I think I think yours is I think yours is right. So actually let me let me go ahead and uh, minimize this. And so let me go ahead and eliminate that. So yours is yours is probably right because I think because you have to because we have to include K because it doesn't make sense to not include it. And so I think I just forgot to do it. So I think this is this is probably the right solution here. And so let me go ahead and, and modify my code just to kind of just to verify. I haven't went through the trouble of defining k up here. So it should be minus k, it should be plus k. Let's see. I think there should be k times this. K, k, k times that. Oh, and I also have the sign. I have the signs reversed here too. Oh. Okay. Oh, never mind. Oh, okay. Oh, so I, I divided by k down here. Okay. Let's see. Let me undo all that stuff. Okay. And so if I divide by k here, then that should reverse the signs. So that's that's okay. Okay. Divided by k in line sixty-two. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So for so I, what I did was I divided the source term by k as well. Let's see. I also did. So it might not be one over eighty. It'd be one over eighty times k, right? Um, no, your your k is over here. So the, the if the k is on the left hand side, it wouldn't be on the right. Um, Let's try this uh, because this should be because this one over eighty should be dx times dx, right? Um, and so let's let's do that instead. Still nothing, huh? Okay. Yeah, because the because the because the actual boundary conditions here are actually forty five and sixty. So actually, the bounds make sense because so and so the bounds should be should be that. I think the issue I think is probably with with these guys because I think if we have k here, that means we have to multiply these by k as well, right? There we go. Okay. Yeah. So, so the uh, it looks like the the main issue was I think you have instead of doing hard coding the uh, one over eighty out here, you have to have a dx times dx because that's because that value in front is going to change depending on the grid spacing of your of, of your mesh, right? Um, and so we we did it for kind of a fifty by fifty here. Um, and so just just to basically just to make sure that it's uh, that that value there adjusts to your grid, you should have it be dx times dx. Um, and I think the, the only other issue was that um, the signs here have to be have to be reversed, and so you have to uh, first of all you have to multiply by k uh, because you kept you because uh, you know we kept k here kind of kind of like exactly the same as I did for the class, um, but then the uh, the signs here have to be um, have to be adjusted so it should be a positive and a positive here, and so if you do that then that should give you the uh, the right graph. Okay. Thank you. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yep. Yeah.
Yeah, so I can I can send you the updated one just so uh, uh, you know just so I think that's a bit easier. But but you got most of it. I think it's just it's just little you know little sign things like that that always seem to throw things off. Yeah, I actually got the change, so you don't have to send it. But okay, thank you. Okay. Really appreciate it. Yep. Mm -hmm. All, All right. right. Have a good weekend. I'll see you next week. Yeah, you too. See you, Professor.